I think every site should have a global search feature like this. Some of my favorite tools use this and it makes navigating and searching their sites so much easier. Now I've been working on a project that needed this feature as well and I found the perfect tool to make this as easy as possible. So I'll show you the fastest way to build search into your application and one mistake to avoid that could affect your performance. Let's take a quick look at what I've been working on. This is a project called Deals for Devs, and it was intended to be a site where we could list all sorts of relevant deals for developers for Black Friday of 2023. Now, although that time has passed, I wanna keep this around for next year, and I wanna add features and things to it, and maybe even use it throughout the year. So if you have ideas for what I could do during the year, let me know in the comments below. But what I have on the homepage is a couple of feature sections for different deals that I'm working on. Then in here, you can view all of the deals. Now, the problem with looking at all the deals is that you could scroll through this big, long list of deals and be kind of overwhelmed with all the content that's there. So I wanted to recreate what I've seen on a lot of different websites like Next.js, like Astro, Tailwind CSS, and so many more, and have this global search. So inside of here, you can click the button to activate the search, or you can actually use the slash on your keyboard to activate this as well. And then from here, I can just type in what I'm searching for and it will give me only deals that are relevant to that keyword. So you can see all these include the keyword and this is not only searching inside of the title but also inside of the description as well. So it's searching on different properties of the data that I have stored in the database. Now this is a Next.js project, but we'll break down the front end and the back end and you can apply these concepts to any different tech stack that you're using so that you can go out and build this yourself. I'm actually gonna be creating a course around the things that I've learned from building this project and a few others. So if you're interested in that content in the future, make sure to check out my newsletter on my website. So that's the basics of the website. Now all of this data is stored inside of Zeta. So Zeta is a database I've been working a lot recently. One of the big things that I like is the ability to see all of my data inside of a dashboard and to be able to update the schema, update data, et cetera, so that I don't have to build out dashboard components for all this stuff myself. Now, one of the additional neat things that is in here is the ability to generate code snippets for querying your data. So Zeta will actually kind of show a couple of sample queries of how I could query this data. In this case, I call my Zeta client.db.deals and then I select the columns that I'm looking for and then I can paginate that, et cetera. Now that sort of stuff works really, really well, but how do I then go from just a regular query to now adding in search? Now conveniently, Zeta has search built in and I would say that it's one of Zeta's most underrated features. So on the searching records documentation page, you'll have a link to this below. It says that all data inserted into Zeta is automatically indexed for full text search. This means I don't have to do any configuration to optimize being able to search through my data using their API. Now, one thing that's important to know though is the update to the indexing and how it stores it efficiently is updated asynchronously after each insert and update. This means that the search results are eventually consistent, meaning if you write something and query immediately, the query results may not accurately depict that newer information, but it will eventually within milliseconds or a couple of seconds. Now looking at the code snippet in their documentation, integrating with search is super easy. We use a Zeta client, we call search, and then we can pass in a few different properties like which tables I'm looking at, a threshold for fuzziness, et cetera, and then I can get that data back and display it in the application, and that's exactly what I did. But if I wanted to activate search for this, what do I have to do? Well, if we look back at the example in the actual website, we can see that I have this pop-up that I need to maintain, and then I can type in a query in here, and then what it does, it sends an API request to the backend, the backend does the searching using the SDK, and then it returns back results that get shown up here. So let's go and see what this looks like. I can start by creating a blank API endpoint inside of Next.js using the app router. So inside of here, this goes inside of the app directory and then under API and under deals and then it's route.tsx. So this is how we define a brand new endpoint inside of Next.js. Now from here, I wanna get a reference to what the query string is that the user is searching for. So to do that, we can pass it in as a query string and that means that the URL is going to look like this. So url.com question mark and then query equals, and then something like TypeScript. So that's what it's gonna look like. So to get that, we reference the search params, and then we query the search params for the actual key value pair with a name of query. From there, we can return back a bad request if the query string isn't there. That way we make sure that the user is actually searching for something. Then we can get a reference to our Zeta client. Then we can use the search API on our deals database, pass in that query, and then pass in the target, which is the name of the tables we wanna search for. Now remember, this is searching based on the name property and then the description. 
From there, we can destructure the records that it returns, and then we can return that data as JSON. Lastly, we can surround all this with a try catch to make sure we handle any errors. But now this API endpoint is able to take that query string from the user, use the Zeta SDK to be able to search and then return back those records. Now, if we look inside the front end again, there's a couple things we have to wire up to make this all work. One is we need to have a pop-up where we can display all the different data. We need to be able to open and close this using the escape key and then the X button inside of this. I also wanna be able to trigger this from a shortcut using in this case slash. So I could click on this button or just hit slash and then I'll activate this as well. Then I wanna be able to handle queries in here and be able to display information. And lastly, we'll talk about performance to make sure we don't wipe out our API calls. So the first thing I did was create an overlay component. Now the overlay component has a bunch of different Tailwind classes just for styling, but basically it takes up the entire page. It is position fixed. So as we scroll, it stays on top of everything. And then it just has the button to be able to close and calls an event handler that's passed as a property. The two other properties that it takes is an is open Boolean. So we're gonna have one of these overlays and we're gonna control whether or not it's open. And then lastly, it takes children, which we could pass in different children to display different things inside of the pop-up. Now, the interesting thing about tracking whether or not this thing is open is we wanna control this from two different places. That means that we need to keep track of this Boolean in some sort of shared state. So to do that, we're gonna use the context API. So inside of my search context, I create the search context. I expose that through the use search hook, which we'll see in a minute. And then we keep track of two properties that come from use state the Boolean to keep track of whether or not the search bar is open, and then the function to be able to call to update that to true or false. We add those values to our provider, and now that will be accessible into any components that are wrapped by the search context. So if we go into our root layout now, we have the ability to wrap the nav bar and our global search. Those are the two places that we wanna be able to control whether or not the search bar is open. If we look inside of the navbar code, we can see there's one button in here that can activate that search and it's click handler just calls the set search open function and sets it to true. Now we can get into the global search component, which actually make the API request to the backend and then displays this data. So if we look inside of our global search component, you can see we're referencing that global state using the use search hook to be able to control whether or not the search bar is open. Now there's a few extra things in here that we'll come back to in a second, but let's go down to where we actually handle the user input and then make the request to the backend. So inside of the markup, you can see we reference our overlay component and then we pass in all the properties that we want to display inside of that pop-up. Now the most important thing is this input where we're gonna take the user's input and then when that value changes, we're gonna call the handle search on change. Now inside of this handle search on change, we check to see if there is a value. If there's not, we just set the current deals to be null. Then we set a loading property to be true so we can keep track of whether or not this request is currently loading. And then lastly, we make the fetch request to that backend endpoint at API slash deal slash, and then we add in the value of that input from the user as the query string parameter inside of the URL. We then check to see if the response comes back okay. And if it does, we grab the data and then set that data to be displayed inside of the application. If we scroll down a little bit, we can see the logic where we check the loading property to add the loading state. And then lastly, we come down and check to see if we're not loading and we have deals, we go ahead and display each one of those by iterating through each one and displaying a link card for it. Now that all works pretty well, but there's actually one big downside to the code as is. And that is the fact that it's gonna be making an API request on every single input that the user is typing. That means they could continue to just mash keys and it would make tons of requests, not only to your serverless function in Next.js, from there it would make tons of requests to your database, which is not something that you want. So in this application, I added a neat little trick for debouncing, which basically says, I'm not going to make the request to the backend until I'm pretty sure the user is done typing. So what does that look like? As they type a couple of characters, I wanna wait until they pause and stop typing for a second or two seconds or three seconds, and then make the request. So to do that, we can keep track of a timer in JavaScript and reset this timer anytime the user types some sort of new input and only make the request again after we feel like they're done and they're ready for the search to actually happen. So if we look inside of our state properties, notice we have a reference to a timer, which is a Node.js timeout. So we're gonna use a set timeout and then keep track of what that returns, which is the timer itself, which allows us to cancel that later on. So if we come back to our handle search on change function, you can see that we look to see if there is an existing timer. So if they click A and then we create a timer and then click B really quickly, that previous timer already exists. If it does, we clear that timer so it doesn't execute any requests to the backend. 
From there, we then set a new timeout. And in this case, it's 500 milliseconds, which is half a second, a delay. And so with that set timeout, that returns to us our new timer that we set to our state. And then after this has executed, it's going to run the code that's inside of here, which actually makes the request to the backend. This way, we're not making too many requests to our backend, which then make a lot of requests back to our database. This is actually really crucial for you to include if you add some sort of search and search functionality to your site so that you don't overwhelm your backend and your database as well. Now, if we go back over to the running application, we can actually see this in action. So if I start to type TYP and do it really fast, notice there's not gonna be a request for T and then TY and then TYP. We only see the full thing of TYP. Same thing if I finish typing TypeScript, there's no additional request until I've stopped typing for a given amount of time, which in this case is 500 milliseconds, and then it makes that request. And that's how I added search in my Next.js site using Zeta. Now Zeta took care of all the hard work by having search just available to me. All I had to do was build that API endpoint and be able to request that from the front end and add some logic to do deep bouncing to make sure I don't overwhelm the back end and the database. If you have any ideas for what I could do with this project through the rest of the year, let me know in the comments below. And if you're interested in learning more about how I built this, let me know what topics you would like to see and make sure to subscribe to my newsletter because I'm going to end up turning all this stuff into a course of learning of using Next.js 14 and the app router and Zeta and getting into AI, which Zeta has some cool features around as well. So I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll catch you next time.